welcome to this new season of Gospel Online videos. My name is Josh and today we're going to be looking at the Gospel in simple terms. So, if you just want the quick answers, what does the word mean? It means good news. Why does it describe what Jesus does? Well, he is showing that the promises God made to save the world and humanity are still happening and that one day soon God is going to rule the earth through his chosen king who is Jesus. The wait is over. Now the early followers of Jesus use the gospel to refer to the death and resurrection of Jesus because God raised him from the dead and so he demonstrates that he was the chosen one that faithful people had been looking for and now people could follow secure in the knowledge that God's plan was happening. Now let's go into a bit more detail. The gospel has been a major part of Christian proclamation. When you speak to a Christian and you ask them what do they believe in, chances are they might say something uh, that uh, incorporates the words the gospel into their answer. But what do they mean by this sort of shorthand um, code word, the gospel? What, what's, what's lying behind that? What's the reason that that word is used to represent Christian belief and the basis of Christian practice? Well, the word gospel comes from an old English word, God spell, which just means good news. And that's a really great definition because the Greek word underlying gospel in the New Testament, which was written in Greek originally, euangelion is the word, also translates to good news as well. But what's so good about this news and what is the news itself? What has happened that needs to be reported that people everywhere need to know about? Well, let's have a look. We're going to think about the gospel in three different ways, starting with the big, big picture and then focusing in on an individual. The first level that we're going to look at is God's plan for the entire earth. Second, we're zooming into the national scale from the global scale. I'm going to think about God's chosen people, uh, the nation of Israel. And then thirdly, as we zoom all the way in, we're focusing on one individual, Jesus of Nazareth, his message, his actions, his life, and what it means to follow him. Those three ideas that culminate and will end with the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus are helpful to, to understand when we think about what the gospel is. Uh, if, if you were zooming in on a camera, at the widest point we're, we're focusing on the, uh, the global scale, the plan for the whole world. If we zoom in a little bit to the national scale, we see the people of Israel and the story of the children of God. And then finally, if we focus in all the way, sort of zooming in on our Google Earth, as it were here, we focus in on one individual, on Jesus of Nazareth and him and his words and his actions, his life, his death and his life again. As we think about the level one, though, the big global scale picture is ultimately the, the, the creative work of a loving and merciful God who wants to work with humanity. And we're going to come to Jesus of Nazareth. But his teachings, the, the sermons, the parables, the, the healings, the things he said and things he did, didn't come entirely out of nowhere. As you think about Jesus, you know, standing up and delivering the Sermon on the Mount or teaching in parables somewhere. Imagine there's a radio playing in the background. The music that is being played is the music of the Hebrew Scriptures, of the Old Testament. There's the, the national story of Moses and the exodus from Egypt. There's the immensity and the immediacy of the, the powerful prophets, people like Isaiah, who called out the power and the corruption and the injustice that he saw in the society around him. And then there's the, the sweet wine and the bitter tears mingled together of the Psalms, emotional outpourings of, of lament and victory and rejoicing. The people who were listening to Jesus, they knew these, these passages, they knew these references very well. They were well attuned to the music of the Hebrew scriptures or the Old Testament, as, as Christians often call it. And Jesus picks up these threads of the national past and the individual writers and the law codes and the, the family wisdom. And he weaves it all together in a way that points to him and to his work. And the people who listen and who follow him are called the disciples of Jesus. And we'll meet up with them later. But first, let's look back. Let's think about one example of these references that Jesus works with. Because he's going to pick up these ideas from the Hebrew scriptures and they're going to echo in the things that he does and the things that he says. Here is one such example. 
This goes back to the book of Isaiah, and it talks about God's comforting news for Israel, who are in exile at this point. They've been invaded, and lots of their people have been taken away captive, and they are being given this good news that God is going to redeem them. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. So we see there this idea of good news being brought to people who desperately need some good news. That is the gospel here in Isaiah's day. And Jesus is going to pick up on this later on. But the good news here is that God is doing something and it's going to change everything. We see Jesus of Nazareth moving around the north of Israel and he's teaching and he's proclaiming and he's talking about the coming kingdom of God, which is going to incorporate uh, those ideas that we saw back in Isaiah. Jesus taught that God was faithful to the promises that he had made and oppression is going to be removed. Even sickness and death in some sense somehow are going to be defeated and things are going to look different in this kingdom of God that is coming to the earth. Jesus says that he is the one who's going to be the one who's going to deliver the justice and deliver the mercy that God has promised. Now, this is a, a massive, big, scandalous claim. And so as Jesus goes around teaching and preaching, this is the message that he is delivering. And it causes a bit of a problem. As he moves specifically towards Jerusalem, towards the capital, he runs up again and again against powers that seem to be opposing him because the combined religious and political powers in the city and surrounding they don't like this message of a, a new king on the scene a massive shake-up in the way that things are going the possibility of destruction of the the systems that they knew and understood and had benefited from well jesus is arrested he is forced through a sham trial and he is murdered by the collective powers, the organised religious peers and political enforcement powers. And his disciples, the people who followed him, they desert and they scatter. And so it seems the movement has come to an end. If the supposed king, Jesus, is dead, then there can't be a kingdom with him ruling. And so that's why when we talk about the gospel, eventually we must come to this the central point the, the focal event that if you only could pick on one thing that happened in space and in time to represent the whole of the gospel message condensed down and boiled down to its its simplest form we would have to talk about the resurrection because this focuses us on the main message of the gospel and it's this that in the first century there was this fierce prophet this teacher who goes around talking about the kingdom of God, that it's on its way. And he talks about the poor and he talks about the sick and the needy and the oppressed. And he condemns those who oppress and extort people uh, around them. And not only does he condemn them, he also condemns the people who simply stand by and watch these things going on and ignore the plight and the suffering. And this prophet who is taken and arrested and killed by the collective religious and political powers of the empire. That this person, this local teacher, this no-name individual, turns out to be and is vindicated as the son of God and is raised from the dead because what he did and what he said and what he stood for and what he represented in his message is so important, is so vital, is so instructional, so inspirational in the best sense of the word, that he could not be allowed to stay dead. This, I think, is the heart of the gospel, that Jesus had to be raised from the dead because he was the person who is going to bring God's plan to fruition and its fulfillment on the earth. He is going to be the king of the kingdom of God. He is going to be there to judge and administer and dispense the justice and the mercy that God wants to change things for the better, to right the wrongs and correct the mistakes. To set up God's kingdom, we have to look to the king. The resurrection underlines the, the name of Jesus. It sort of elevates and promotes and highlights in bold that Jesus is the chosen one who God wants to reign on the earth. And the I find this impossible not to think about, certainly impossible not to want to look closer into. So let's look at a couple examples. This is an early Christian writing to another group of people in the Jesus movement. This is a man called Paul, and he's writing probably early on in the 50s CE. 
probably only about two decades after the resurrection itself. And he's writing to a group of people in a place called Corinth, and he's reminding them of this important thing. He's talking to them about the gospel. It's in there in bold. That's our word for euangelion, the good news, the gospel. And Paul is writing to them and he's saying, I'm going to remind you, brothers and sisters, and that's a way of uh, talking about sort of fellow uh, followers of, of Jesus. I'm reminding you of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received. So Paul had already visited them and he had told them these things before. The good news he goes on to describe here is what I handed on to you as of first importance, what I had in turn received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. Paul is going to go on and then list a, a longer list than appears on the screen there of other people who have seen the risen Jesus. Now this information is the heart of the gospel, that Jesus died and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third so, day. Look here, if I move on and highlight some different words in bold, in accordance with the scriptures, twice there. That's that's what we were looking at with the, uh, the quotations from Isaiah. There's plenty of other places throughout the Hebrew scriptures where we have these links, the prophets, the law, the Psalms, the wisdom writings. In some parts and in some places, they are directing people to look forwards to Christ or the, the anointed one, the, the chosen one of God who is going to to do God's will on earth. Sometimes that's what, yeah, that person is also referred to as the Messiah. This person is going to re reverse the fortunes of the nation of Israel and reverse the fortunes of the whole world and rescue and save and redeem it. The gospel here for Paul, as he describes it to these believers, the things that he is reminding them of is that there is history that points people towards these events, but also this is the beginning of something exciting and new. Because what Jesus has done and what has been achieved in his life picks up on what has gone before and also brings about something new. But Paul here is also saying slightly more than that. He's also saying these are real historical events. These things really happened. Jesus really did die. He really was buried. He really was raised from the dead. And that really is good news. So we looked at one example of people talking about the gospel in the New Testament. Let me show you just one more here. The first one was from Paul writing to believers in Corinth. This one is not a letter, but instead a speech that uh, one of the disciples of Jesus who followed him personally during his ministry, a man called Peter, um, a speech that he gave. And he describes exactly the same sort of thing that Paul described as the gospel back in Corinthians. He says here, this is uh, in the book called Acts or Acts of the Apostles. He says, we are witnesses to all that Jesus did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him and everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So there we have in this speech in Acts and there are other speeches in Acts which I'd recommend you go read as well. I'll put the uh, references down in the description below that give a, a nice sort of condensed version of the gospel message. This is a short version of the, the gospel sort of being proclaimed in the early days of the Christian movement. Jesus died. Jesus was raised. This is good news and you can participate in it. It links back to the, to the prophets testifying about him. That's that link back to, uh, to our second thread, the, the story of Israel, uh, God's continued work with people throughout the centuries. And so when we come across this word gospel, which means good news, these are some of the thoughts that should be, should be, should be echoing and resounding in our minds. That Jesus died, that he was raised, and that that is good news for the whole world. I want to finish with one final reference here. This is Jesus describing his mission, why he was doing and saying the things that he was doing. It's the most famous verse in the whole Bible, um, and so it's a great place to finish. The gospel is the good news concerning the kingdom of God that is coming to change the world for the better. It is ratified, it's underlined, it's made uh, definitive and useful and energizing because Jesus has been raised from the dead. And so when we read this, which is in the Gospel of John, the good news message written by John, in chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, 
that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There are different apostles, Peter and Paul, they preach the same message to all kinds of different people in different ways, in different places. They preached and their sayings were not hidden. There was no price of entry to listen to the gospel message. They talk about Jesus. They talk about his death and being raised back to life and what this means for the people who come to understand it. They link back to the, to the teachings, the echoes that are, are seen right the way through the Hebrew scriptures. All of this wrapped up with God's overarching, overriding plan to rescue and save the world. And in Jesus's words here and elsewhere in the New Testament, we get parables and we get guidance and we get wisdom and we get these stories, these rich, fascinating and revealing stories that have multiple layers that we can learn about his message, the proclamation of the gospel, the proclamation of the kingdom of God and the proclamation that he was the son of God who was coming to save people from sin and from destruction. The resurrection is this powerful example that helps us understand this. It calls us to transformation. It calls us to respond to it, an acknowledgement that Jesus is king, that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is God's chosen one. So we've looked at the gospel in a very broad and quick, simple way. God has a plan to rescue and redeem the whole earth. That plan was talked about, was hinted at, was mentioned and called out throughout the Hebrew scriptures. It's bound up in the story of the people of Israel. And Jesus picks up and weaves those threads together. He is the uh, bringer of God's justice and mercy to the earth. And he is going to be the king in charge of God's kingdom. And he is uh, he's ratified, he's sort of made clear and obvious the person who is going to be do this by the fact that he was raised from the dead. Now we can go and we can read the, the first four books of the New Testament, which are called Gospels. They talk about the life and the work, the message, the teaching and preaching that Jesus does and uh, give us these excellent portraits of what he was like and what the message he was trying to convey was. So I recommend you want to, to find out more about the gospel message to start there uh, and read those four books. As you do that and as you go through, you'll find the gospel referenced in a number of different ways. And I want to finish with this final verse, the most famous verse in the whole Bible, to try and wrap all of these ideas up into one nice little package. Because this here, again, is another very condensed form of the gospel, the good news that has been brought about in the life and death and life again of Jesus of Nazareth. Throughout the New Testament, the apostles preach the, the good news. The people who are sent out by Jesus talk about the good things that he has done. And here in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, we see uh, a wonderful little summary of the message that they preach. It's the same wherever they travel and whoever they're speaking to. They talk about Jesus, his death, his resurrection and his new life and what that means for everybody. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, it says these very famous words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We see in this a short summary that contains so much that God loves the world and wants to save those who are in it. Through Jesus, his son, his death and his resurrection, he is calling us towards himself, that we might respond positively to what we hear, so that we might be seen as, as faithful followers of Jesus, as the early disciples were. The resurrection is this powerful example of transformation to understand, to be interested in, and work towards a more compassionate and humane world. And it points us towards repentance. It points us towards acknowledgement that Jesus is King, that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is God's chosen. So that has been the gospel in simple terms. It was a brief overview, but the good news is that we have more videos coming up in this series. 
There's going to be some on the historical evidence for the resurrection. There'll be some on the links between the teachings of Jesus and the Hebrew scriptures. So if you're interested in those or other subjects, stay tuned for the next videos that are coming out after this one. Let me know down in the comments if there's any specific subjects that you'd like us to look at in the future. And if there are any terms or words that I've used that I didn't explain enough, definitely let me know and I can try and answer any questions in the comments below. But also feel free to reach out to us via our website. There's a whole load of resources that we've put together. There's also links to, to send us an email if you want to get in contact and find out more about the Christadelphians and what we believe. Uh, that said, I hope you have safety where you are. I hope you have peace and I hope this has helped.